Dulwich is a very interesting kind of concept. I cannot describe it, but it's art in bucket loads. You'd kind of think that a collection that finished somewhere in the middle of the 1800s was a very sleepy affair, and not a bit of it. If you look at the collection as a whole, one of its great values is that uh, it represents a moment in history. This is a collection that was put together around 1800, and the taste involved reflects that. This room, uh, it's got one or two of my favorites. This one for a very odd reason. This is not a great masterpiece, I don't think. But um, it's a very popular painting. Uh, the clue is in the little cushion here with a crown on top. Um, this is Queen Victoria, <laughs> aged four. And um, as you can see, she didn't change much in her life. She was always kind of square, basically. And she was always that side. It's by um, Stephen Points Denning, who was the first keeper of the gallery. So in those days, they, they appointed um, artists, practicing artists, to run the gallery because, of course, it saved on conservation. <laughs> Basically, this man could come in and, and, and freshen up the paintings and look after them properly, and it was thought that an artist could do that. This one, however, is um, an out-and-out -out masterpiece, and this is Canaletto. Uh, many people, obviously, people are aware of Canaletto, all those wonderful views of Venice, but people forget that, in fact, he followed the market for 10 years he came to England. So Canaletto was based in England for 10 years producing works that are recognizably him, of course, but of English subjects. Now, this is Old Walton Bridge. Um, this bridge no longer exists. I mean, we'd know if it did. It's quite remarkable. It's this extraordinary kind of engineering structure in wood. Um, and he's recorded it. Like always with Canaletto, you get these little glimpses of reality. I mean, it looks like a little photograph. There's a little village in the background there, and all the detail is there from the ducks on the green to the people out for a walk. But also, there's Thomas Hollis, who is the man who commissioned the painting. And that means, I think, that we can assume that this gentleman here, who is sitting on a folding seat beside the, the river with paper and a brush and a palette, this is Canaletto. This is another of my favorites. And I'm not alone in this. It's a famous painting, in fact. But it's not a famous name. I mean, if you look at the label, it's, it's now attributed to Arendt de Gelder. And uh, it sounds like a sneeze, but actually, he was Rembrandt's last pupil. Now, one of the things about art history is that, of course, the, the markets come and go. In the 18th century, Rembrandt was still hot stuff. Rembrandt never went out of fashion. Arendt de Helder, on the other hand, wasn't, didn't have a high value in the sale room. So, of course, some 18th century dealer had covered up the signature and written in Rembrandt here. In the 19th century, this was the, one of the most famous paintings in the gallery. And it was famous because it was by Rembrandt, they thought. And they appreciated everything. People waxed lyrical about the, the invention, the imagination, how only the greatest possible master could have produced this extraordinary image. And then someone found the original signature. Now nobody bothers. 
Same painting. <laughs> Same painting, but the power of the market has fallen away. Rembrandt's signature is no longer there. People don't give it the same value. But it's a fantastic painting. Fantastic painting. The John Soane building is a mighty enough building on its own, you know, without any paintings. No, it's, it's, a, it's an icon. It's become an icon. It's hugely influential as a building. He's one of these architects who responds well to financial pressure. Uh, you know, if you say, well, yes, your designs are lovely, but actually we've only got a third of the money, which is basically what the gov governors of Dulwich College were saying to him, uh, he responds pragmatically. And at some point he realized he had to use London Brick. Now, London Brick was, very, was a very mean considered at the time a very mean material uh, in which to build a grand gallery but given that that was what he could afford he takes the London brick and turns it into something monumental and we have the blueprint for all other public art galleries. We were the first public art gallery in England and um, we were established by the two gentlemen behind me of my shoulder here. On the left, uh, Noel Desenfant was a Frenchman and on the right, a Swiss, Sir Francis Bourgeois, much younger of the two. And they worked as, um, as art dealers. Uh, they put together this great collection um, in doing so, they, they, were, they were trying to come up with something didactic. It was meant to reflect the, the history of Western art. Why they gave it to Dulwich College, we don't really know. Um, Desenfant died first in 1807, Bourgeois in 1811. And in those two weeks before he died, he made his will in which he bequeathed this amazing collection that the two of them had put together uh, to Dulwich College. They liked the clean air. Uh, it's a conservation issue now, of course, and it's still true, of course, of Dulwich. And they liked the fact, I think, that it was going to a school, so it was for educational purposes. And those are the principles that govern all public art galleries even now. Well, here we are walking into a very modern part of the, the building. We closed in 1999 for refurbishment. Uh, long overdue, there was a lot of work to do in the gallery. But at the same time, the architect was Rick Mather, who's a very well-known uh, American architect, uh, had to build an extension. And he decided to go very much with the idea of a, of a cloister. And it's worked beautifully. I, I, I still love this space. It feels warm and welcoming. We now have, of course, as you can see behind me, an extremely glamorous cafe something that Soane didn't have to worry about, of course, but we do. People coming all this way and not being able to get a, get a cup of tea, you know, is not on. And if we move down here, we're back into the uh, Jacobean on the right, um, the, the, the 20th century additions to the gallery on the left, the Sackler Centre down here, everything completely cutting edge and modern on one side. And then you get little details like this, which are a kind of Victorian gloss on, a, on an acorn, um, which is the, the entrance to the, the Jacobean Chapel. So uh, Mather has kind of put all this together, brought the history of the building together in a really remarkable way, I think. And he leads you down here very subtly, one step at a time, and then as you go around the corner, you're into the last stretch before entering the gallery. founders had really good eye, uh, they got masterpieces. So they didn't just get Rembrandt, they got one of the best. The Rubens is the best. Poussin can't get better. You know, that's the great value of Dulwich. It doesn't change. We don't buy millions of new paintings and put the old ones that we don't like back in store. 
they're all out. They're all old friends. They've been here for nearly 200 years. And all right, you may not like one artist. You may think that it's unimportant. Wait 50 years, you'll probably be back in again. Um, you can never judge fashion. And fortunately for us, um, at, at its core is a body of masterpieces that any gallery in the world would, would kill for. We're in the National Gallery, in the Conservation Department of the National Gallery, and I've been um, allowed to bring the painting here because it's such a very valuable, important painting. We were becoming concerned about the stability of the paint surface, which was not in danger of immediate flaking, but the craculea, the paint, the cracks, the natural aging craculea of the paint surface was beginning to become a little bit raised and sharp and obviously needed some attention. It took me about something like two weeks to remove the varnish from this painting. Then I had to introduce the adhesive into the cracks. That took two or three weeks really just to be absolutely sure. I'm very impressed that people are, I'm, a, I'm allowed to work on a Rembrandt. It's, it's exciting. Um, whether it's terrifying is another matter because I don't think it would be very useful to be terrified. But um, not many people have a chance to work on a Rembrandt, so I think I'm amazingly lucky and privileged. She's a very familiar image that you think of this painting when you think of Dulwich Picture Gallery. When a major painting is absent, I, I walk through these galleries at my peril because our local supporters here, who are our people who come back again and again and again and love the place, will buttonhole me. You know, where is she? When's she coming back? And quite right too. This has been away for uh, a while now, in Italy and to the Tate in London. And when a painting comes back from being on loan, you, uh, you have to get it in, you have to check that nothing has happened. And so um, we have Sophie here is, is looking at the condition report, which we write for every painting that goes out. So we, every little thing. The history of this <clears throat> is really the history of celebrity. It's a very important painting because it's, it's by Joshua Reynolds, who is a great master. Um, and he, he was interested in the creation. I mean, this is what this exhibition that's been lent to is about. It's called The Creation of Celebrity. Mrs. Siddons is really one of the first characters who looms like a modern film star. Actresses in the 18th, 17th century may have had their fans, but there was always a sense that they were no better than they should be actresses. It wasn't a respectable profession, however entertaining they may have been. Mrs. Siddons turned that on its head. She is the first superstar of the British stage. Now, the point about this painting is that Reynolds, there's a wonderful story. Reynolds set her up. She was very grand. She was a grande dame for theatre. And her, her painting was to be done. Reynolds very cleverly flattered her. It's very important. Gainsborough, when he painted her, is famous for having said to her, Madam, there is no end to your nose, he said, slightly tactlessly. Reynolds dealt with it differently. He had a throne set up. He said, Madam, take your throne. Adopt a posture redolent of the tragic muse. And she went, mm. And he said, perfect, and painted it. Flattery. The image suggests tragedy. Tragedy suggests classical mythology. Classical mythology does not suggest one step up from the brothel. This is an actress of serious import, the first great star of the stage. We want to lend because we feel these are our gift, if you like, this is the gift of the world. Uh, and it's good for paintings to be seen by other people. So there's a, there's a good altruistic reason there as well. 
There's a thoroughly selfish reason, which is that we want to borrow. If we were to sum up what we do, uh, it's to encourage the enjoyment of the visual arts. It's as simple as that. Exhibitions are one of the key ways of doing it. With a, an old master show, you get a certain kind of audience. With Beatrix Potter, which is going up at the moment, you know, we'll get a lot of small kids and their grandparents and that kind of thing. And that's really nice. It introduces different people to the gallery. So it, it performs a, an important function. Um, I need you to pack these two here. Now, this needs glass tape, I'm pretty sure it does. Okay, and I need you to check the condition report. Um, it's soft wrapped, but um, okay, it needs okay. more than that. We'll do corners. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we're just in the middle, as you can see, uh, of taking down the Graham Sutherland exhibition, which is on here at the gallery, in the exhibition spaces. Um, on the second day of the takedown, um, and by the end of the week, we should have painted all the galleries and have it all ready for the next exhibition to go up. We, we, we have our schedule for our, exhibition, our major exhibition programme in place for about four or five years ahead. We know what we're going to be doing. And each exhibition... Um, has various stages, but for about a year in advance of an exhibition, you're working on it. Are you guys ready to go now? Yeah. Yeah. Good. When people don't lend, it's usually because the work is too fragile to be lent, or, um, or it's a part of their collection where it's a major part of the collection. And so that's when you have to try and negotiate with them. We can't put on a blockbuster about Vermeer or Van Gogh because we're too small. We can't do it. Uh, we couldn't cope with the numbers. We couldn't cope with... We couldn't get people to come here for, even for that kind of thing. So we're not driven by the same blockbuster-itis that, you know, drives the big galleries around the world. We can pick and choose a bit and make sure that things are, are really interesting, that they have a good intellectual core to them or are quirky in some way, original. That's our great strength. We want to reach all sorts of audiences, and if we waited for them to find us, I think we might wait a very long time. We might wait forever. So the key to finding those audiences is to go out and, and get them somewhere in an outreach programme and then seduce them to coming back to the gallery. And then we, we get them here and we introduce people in a, in a special way of making them feel very at home, very welcome. And of course having the wonderful Sackler Studio here means that we can do a great range of art programs, creative art programs, and that is the way to tempt so many people. We have life drawing in there, we have watercolour painting, textiles, model making, um, clay heads, carving, as well as the run of the mill, things that you would do every day. It's really well used and, and we love that space. We just need a lot more of spaces like that. I could do with three or four of them. Easy peasy brown paint would be earth. So this is, this is just Earth uh, from Devon. We've got a science person who comes along and she says, explains, there's just no art without a scientific element. Paint can't stay on a canvas on its own without a sticky stuff to make it stick. How does that happen? Paint is just pigment with the sticky stuff. And she will teach our groups to make the pigment from scratch, just as they were doing in old master studios. And that's a, a glorious uh, session to watch. This is quite, quite a modern um, uh, pigment. We have a Gainsborough in the gallery of um, two girls called the Lindley sisters. And one of them's wearing a yellow dress, and we know that the yellow dress was painted with this colour, which is called Indian yellow. So that sort of tells you where the colour came from. Um, and it's made from cow's urine. And they had to sort of give these cows a special diet um, of mango leaves to, to make them produce bright yellow pea. They've got a fantastic education department here which was 
set up by Gillian Wolfe about, I think, 20 years ago. It's rather nice that I was seconded here as an experiment to see if we could attract people to Dandish Picture Gallery to learn about the paintings. And in those days, it was thought highly unlikely that anyone would like to come to do just that. I mean, at that time, as far as I was, I'm aware, that I don't think they had education departments in music. Now everybody's got them. The experiment was given initially, I think, about three months. And, well, here we are, nearly 21 years later, so it shows that people are interested in collections like this. When we came here for the very first time, and we were told that this was probably one of the first galleries, the collection that we saw, they were kind of claustrophobic in a way, showing like all the paintings close together. We've never seen this in any other gallery, but they kind of work well off each other, and the actual gallery itself brings out the best in it, the colours, the lighting. Garage is a very posh gallery, and it has Baroque paintings in it, and youth does not easily come to Baroque paintings. It was quite new coming to an old gallery. I'm used to modern art, the Turner Prize, uh, Sartre Gallery. You look at it at first and you're not sure if you like it, but then once you hear all the stories and all the background about the paintings and all the stories about the painters, then you suddenly start looking at it in a different light. There's certain pieces like the Saint Sebastian and one on, not the Virgin Mary, I think there's one. They're them quite in them pieces, they strike because you know where they come from. They've got quite a good story behind them. The nice thing about the way we treat young people here is that they're with one of our uh, team of teachers all the time. So they don't have to wander around, they don't have to get the information from worksheets or anything. There's always somebody there to talk about the paintings in a very personal way. So you kids come round here. And you sit down in front of me. We've got a storyteller called Roberto, who's um, a very charismatic figure, and he uses lots of body language, and he's a wow in front of the paintings. This is one of my favorite paintings, and whenever I walk by, I have a smile, because I think it's so funny. Can you see the lady there? Her name is Aphrodite, the goddess of love. See the little boy there? That's the sun. His name is Cupid. What has that boy got that you haven't got? Wings. He flies around with his wings, and when he sees people and he wants to make them fall in love, you shoot them in the heart. Show me your arrow. Right, feel, feel the feathers. Feel the point. Right, put it down. Get your bow, nice and big, with a big string. Pick up the arrow, there's a little notch at the end with the feathers. Put it on the bowstring, slip it down. Right, get hold of it. Pull it back, right. Let's aim at him. Aim. Can you show us where your heart is, please? Right. Let's aim at the heart. Ready? One, two, three. Brilliant. I've got to tell you the truth. One day, he will shoot an arrow into your heart. There's no one way into fine art. So what we try to offer is as many different routes as possible. One of the projects that we've got here that we're particularly excited about at the moment that is highly responsive is something called Digit. And this is an, uh, a digital uh, way of teaching about the paintings with handheld palm top computers. <laughs> will come to the gallery, they'll be given a little palm top computer each. They will pick the trail, which in this case is how symbols tell stories. Then they are given the option of which painting to start off with. So they'll all choose different paintings. 
So here we have little miniatures of the paintings that they can choose. They can scroll down until they find the one that they'd like to start with. And here, for example, is a, is a miniature of this Horatius defending the bridge. This picture is full of symbolism, and it shows how symbols can tell a story. And the children have to work this out for themselves. They have to make their own connections, draw their own conclusions. And they love the fact that a teacher isn't talking to them. Everything that the children do, and they put, they put in answers, and they tick, tick boxes, and so forth, in these little palmed up computers, is automatically saved. All that information can be accessed back at school. There are discussion topics. There are other web pages that I lead them to and lots of other activities that they can do in school, drawing activities, um, all relating to the national curriculum, which the teachers really like as well. <laughs> we have interest from America. We've had um, people from the education departments of the Guggenheim in New York, from the Met, from Chicago, from Los Angeles, from really, Americans are so interested in this. We are really the first people to do it. We want to make that beginning moment very special and let's face it, we only have one chance to do it. If they don't like it, their first visit, why should they ever come here again? And the idea is to make them want to come back and back and back and that's really what we're interested in. I'm not so much interested in the one-off visit, although that's fine. I want people to have a really terrific relationship with this gallery and keep coming back and back and back because they love it. I definitely come back, yeah. It's just, I like the atmosphere and to be honest, they do have some good works here and good exhibitions, so I would come back. They also do good cake. <laughs> these are modern, you know, these are modern boys and girls coming in and seeing Dulwich Picture Gallery. And that's what will make it carry on into the future as being a, a wonderful place and an exciting place to visit. <laughs> People come to see Ginger the cat, let alone Rembrandt. And Ginger's been here for ages, and he's part of the gallery as well. You know, we, we are surrounded by this cocoon of people who are generally incredibly supportive. This is our core audience. They come again and again and again. These are the people who man the desk, who, who come to the Friends events all the time. It, it has a very strong local impact. So we look after them here, and uh, there are loyalist supporters. It's really important to stay fresh with what you do. And we could just sit down and say this is working well, but just keep doing it. But I think we'll all be bored to death. And my friend, I think I, I would um, find that very tedious indeed. And I'm not really happy unless we're always trialling something new and piloting something new here. That's got to go alongside that maintaining that special relationship with the public and innovating have got to go hand in hand, the two things together, and innovation is what we love here. Now Ian Desjardins has taken over, who you know, was the curator, and he's kind of going to give it a big push and make it, you know, a museum that people will come from all over the world to see. That's nice, we can handle that in South London. I'm not proud.